Hello students, this is the Head and Neck Anatomy Lecture on Chapter 8, The Oral Cavity. These are the structures that you will need to be very familiar with since the oral cavity will be your home in your dental hygiene career. Be sure to go over this chapter several times and listen to this video until you feel confident that you can name and identify all of these structures. The mouth is divided into the oral cavity and the oral vestibule. The oral vestibule is then subdivided into the labial and buccal vestibules. The lips are the gateway to the oral cavity. They represent the junction between the skin and the mucosa. The skin is dry, the mucosa is wet. The structure in the center is an indentation called the philtrum. The vermilion is the reddish pigmented area of the lips. What we know as the lips is referred to as the vermilion zone and vermilion just means red. The vermilion border is the outer edge of the lips where women put on their lip liner. Age and sun damage can make the vermilion border indistinct or irregular. The oral cavity itself begins at the lips and cheeks and ends at the palatine tonsils. These are the tonsils back in here that you generally see enlarged in children. The palatine tonsils are at the sides of the throat and they are located between the anterior and posterior tonsillar pillars. The space between these pillars is called the fossies. The fossies is a narrow passageway that leads from the oral cavity into the pharynx. The space between the tonsillar pillars is basically the airway as it connects with the respiratory system. If you can't see the entire uvula as you can in this picture, and you can't visualize the palatine tonsils on a patient, it is possible that that patient's airway is narrow. Be sure to make a note of this since it is a risk factor for sleep apnea. The labial vestibule faces the lips and the buccal vestibule is the cheek which is in the area of the molar teeth. The vestibule in itself is the space between the lips, the cheeks and the teeth. The cheek is formed by the buccinator muscle covered by skin on the outside and moist mucous membrane on the inside. The ramus limits the posterior extent of the vestibule. In other words, at the ramus, the buccal vestibule ends. The upper posterior vestibule is limited by the ridge of bone of the anterior zygomatic arch. The anterior border is bounded by the lips and buccal mucosa of the cheek laterally. In other words, the labial vestibule is the front portion of the vestibule by the front of the mouth and the lips and the buccal vestibule is in the back towards the molars. The labial vestibule has several structures. The labial frenulum right here, the labial mucosa, the vestibular fornix or also known as the mucobuccal fold, alveolar mucosa, and the mucogingival line. The mucobuccal fold, also known as the vestibular fornix, is the point where the labial or buccal mucosa turns towards the attached gingiva. The alveolar mucosa is movable, it's red, and it lies against the bone. The labial vestibule has minor intrinsic salivary glands. The salivary glands in mammals are exocrine glands, which have ducts that produce, and they produce saliva. 
They also secrete amylase, an enzyme that breaks down starch into maltose. Minor salivary glands within the mouth produce a minor amount of saliva and it is used to keep the mucosa moist. On the buccal vestibule, we find the parotid papilla, which is this structure right here. It is found opposite the maxillary second molar on both sides. The opening duct of the parotid gland called Stenson's duct is found in the middle of the parotid papilla. The parotid gland produces 20 to 25% of the saliva for bolus production and digestion. The lining of the cheek is composed of buccal mucosa, which is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Also frequently found in the buccal vestibule are fordyce granules. These are ectopic sebaceous glands, which can also be found on the lips. Ectopic means that they are found in an abnormal place or position because sebaceous glands are oil glands that are generally found around hair follicles. Alinea alba is a white line that is usually found along the occlusal plane on the buccal mucosa. It is made of keratinized epithelium and it has become keratinized because of the friction of the teeth. If you think you see Alinea alba stretch out the tissues or the cheek and if it disappears it is not keratinized and therefore not Alinea alba. The teeth and surrounding tissue. There are different kinds of gingiva. The free gingiva is the portion of the gum that surrounds the tooth but is not directly attached to the tooth surface. It's like a turtleneck collar around the teeth and that is where we measure for pockets. The papillary gingiva, also known as interdental papilla, is a triangular shaped area that fills the space between the teeth. The alveolar bone proper is that part of the bone of the jaws that provides direct bony support to the teeth. It is covered by attached gingiva. The attached gingiva is firmly bound to the underlying cementum and bone with collagen fibers of the connective tissue. The mucogingival line marks the junction between the attached gingiva, which is keratinized tissue, and the free, non-keratinized alveolar mucosa. The alveolar mucosa is darker than the gingiva because it is non-keratinized, which allows vascular structures to be more visible. In comparing the adult to the deciduous teeth, we find that there are 20 total deciduous teeth versus 32 permanent teeth. Children have 10 deciduous teeth on the maxillary and mandibular arches correspondingly. Each dental arch is divided into two parts, creating four quadrants. Baby molars become permanent premolars. And the adult molars develop independently from the deciduous teeth. Each quadrant of a child's dental arch contains two incisors, one canine, and two baby molars. Each quadrant of an adult's dental arch contains two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three permanent molars. The anatomical crown consists of the enamel, the dentin, the coronal pulp, and then the root contains dentin, radicular pulp or root canal, the apical foramen, and accessory canals. Cementum covers the root. 
enamel covers the crown. The surfaces of the tooth are occlusal, which is the surface that may contact during chewing or mastication, the mesial surface, which is the surface of the tooth that is closer to the median plane, the distal is the surface of the tooth that is more distant from the median plane, lingual means toward the tongue, and labial or facial or buccal means toward the buccal vestibule or the labial vestibule. Facial can refer to either of these. Extensions of the mandible and maxilla that support the teeth are called the alveolar process. They are com uh, composed of two cortical plates, one inner and one outer, and trabecular or spongy bone. Cortical bone, compact bone are both names for the same thing. Spongy bone, trabecular bone are both names for the same thing. The interdental septum is the portion of the alveolar bone which is between the teeth. The interradicular septum is located between the roots and is only found in multi-rooted teeth. The roots of teeth are all surrounded by alveolar bone proper. This concludes part one of the lecture on chapter eight, head and neck anatomy.